Howdy guys. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the process of creating all these procedural panels and then we're going to text right here inside of Quixel Mixer. Um, and we're going to go through a couple of techniques, um, how to obviously create all these panels with all the bolts, how to bake all, all the textures and how to create, you know, this really basic set of layers here for this particular look here. And this is heavily inspired by the SN8 SpaceX Starship launch. I was watching all that stuff and I really like the way that the aluminum looks on the uh, Starship and so I wanted to try to replicate that and also make it a procedural technique and so this is basically what I've come up with. So let's get into it. All right so let's get everything set up. I'm gonna drop down a geometry node here and uh, then I'm going to go and create a tube and this tube is going to basically serve as our mesh and I'm gonna put it onto the Let's put it on the Z axis here and let's make it a little bit taller and add a couple more rows. Basically these rows are going to become the splits in the, the main panels. And then these columns are going to basically serve us um, for the smaller detailed panels. All right. So with that all done, uh, let's add some normals to it so we can use them later on in the graph here. So let's set it to points. So we have some normals. Very nice. All right, and then what I need to do is I need to basically set an ID per row here. Uh, and there's a couple ways to do it. So you could go and drop down a wrangle node. So I'm going to call this set ID. And you could, you know, basically create an ID based off of the primitive position in the Z direction. So basically I would do something like this. I would say um, I at ID is equal to uh, rent. And we're going to basically round to the nearest integer. We're going to round the Z position. Uh, let's do times two. And let's make sure we cast that to an int as well. All right, so now you can see we have this ID value. So if you have your geometry spreadsheet open, um, and I need to actually run this over primitives. Let's set this to primitives. So now we have this ID uh, per primitive. And we are getting negative numbers, but that works just fine. Basically, the whole idea now is that I want to be able to roll through each one of those rows based off of primitive name and that name is going to be this id for in this for loop here so i can just replace name with id and if i do a single pass you can see now i have you know each row separated out now you don't necessarily have to do this particular technique you could always do it a different way so we could always do group right by range and then we can use the rows and columns um, up here to actually just create a uh, selection where we select every other ring basically and so uh, to do that I'm just going to get the number of columns here I think I just need that and then if we just put in that same number of here and then we just do times two we'll get every other yeah so we'll get every other ring right there and the way you could split it up and create this ID right is you could do a split so let's just do let's create um a group name up here that we can actually split on. So let's do even and uh, we'll split on even up here. So let's go split even and then let's just merge them back together. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I can then use an assemble node. So if we use an assemble node here, uh, this will actually go and create the, the name um, attribute for me, right? So now I have this name attribute. So if I were to drop down that for each, uh, named primitive here. You can see by default it's looking for name and this assemble node creates this name attribute with a, a unique ID. In this case it's a string. The one that I set up was in the wrangle node was a an integer. So it works both ways, right? So if I were to plug this into this for each node here and uh, yeah it should already be set up. So now we can go through each one. So a couple ways to do it, right? So uh, I'm just going to leave it on my wrangle node solution here. Uh, the one thing you have to keep uh, in mind when using this particular technique is to basically do it on the direction that you're looking for. So this won't work in all cases. It does work for this particular tube though. So, all right. So with that all set up, uh, let's move on to the next step. So now that we've got each ring basically sep separated out and we can loop through it. So let's set back up that uh, for each named primitive here. And in this case, I'm not going to be using the name attribute. I'm going to be using my custom one called ID. And again, this allows me then to loop through each one of those particular rings. So this represents the larger section of your spaceship, if you will. Uh, what I need to do now on each one of these is 
determine a procedural way to basically break it up into smaller panels. All right, so let's walk through that now. I am going to make myself a little bit of space here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down a wrangle node and I want to create a weighted grouping in here. And so I'm going to run this over uh, primitives. And so the first thing I need is a seed value. So I'm going to drop down a seed value and this is going to be equal to a float channel. So CHF or channel float. And I'm going to call this seed. All right. So this will allow me to get different results per pass. So per loop through this for each loop here. And then I'm going to get a random value. So I'm going to call this my rand val. And this is going to be equal to our rand at prim num. So prim num. And we are going to add on our seed value. So basically every single time we, or every single ring in our loop here, we're going to generate a new seed value. And we're going to get a different random value to use. All right, so the last little bit of information we need here is our weight value. So this will determine how much is selected. All right, so we're going to say CHF and we are going to do weight just for the name. And let's create all those spare parameters here by hitting this little button right there. All right, so now we've got all these values here and I'm just going to initialize my weight value to 0.5. You can put your seed value to whatever you want. All right, so this is really easy at this point. All we need to do is say if our rand value is less than our weight value, then we're going to select your, your primitive. So we're going to say I at group that initializes a group for you. So we're saying it's kind of a shorthand for creating a group in VEX. And the name of the group is uh, selected. So if you prefix your group name with this I at group, it will create a, a primitive group in this case, because I'm running over primitives. All right, I'm just going to set it to one. Uh, the other way you could do it too here in VEX is to set a prim group. So you could use this and follow the instructions here. So give it, you know, your geo, your string name, the value you want, and then set basically. So that's quite a bit of extra to type. So I tend to use this I at group more often. All right. So with that done, let's see what this gives us. So I'm going to call this my weighted grouping like so. All right, cool. All right, let's turn on our groups by hitting this little guy right here. So you can see now, if I go up to my wrangle node, I can quickly go through here and we can also change our weight value. So this weight value gives us a great way to go and select just kind of random uh, primitives based off of this weight value. All right, so the next step in all this to get our paneling done uh, is I use a group expand node. So I basically use this as my initial selection to say, hey, I want a smaller panel here. Uh, and then I expand it uh, to give it just a little bit bigger of a look. All right. And so all we need to do is uh, look for our group. So we want to get our selected. And then I want to basically expand it. And so I need to decrease my weight here a little bit. And there we go. So we also need to put in the uh, selected for the base group. So now you can see if I change my steps, I can expand the group into smaller panels or larger panels, whichever you want. Or I can come up here and I can also, you know, create this kind of effect just by using my weight value. Yeah, I think that'll be cool right there. Maybe a little bit less. So the less weight you have in there, the more panels you'll end up with. Very cool. So then I just need to split on that again here so I can split it up into different pieces this way. I can work on each individual panel. So I'm going to split on selected and then just merge them back. So we'll just merge back here. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it'll separate it out. So when I merge it back, the, the vertices won't fuse together. And that's pretty much all we need to do there. The last thing I need to do, you'll notice that if I were to turn off my single pass here and take a look at my grouping, you're going to get the same grouping for each one of those rows. All right, and so we need to go and create a meta import new node here. And I'm going to call this loop data. There we go. And inside of our weighted grouping, what I want to do is I want to control this weighting right here. You could also go and, you know, change the seed value. Might actually end up just doing both. So we're just going to do a fit and I'm going to do a rand. We're going to do a detail. And I want to get the iteration value from my loop data node. So inside of this particular node here, if you were to go to the detail option, you can see that we have this iteration detail attribute that we can use. 
to generate a random number from. And so we're going to look for that. So we say iteration zero. And I want to fit this between zero and one because the rand function is going to return a number between zero and one. And I want to fit this between something like 0 0.01 and let's say 0 0.5 as our max, like so. And so you can see now we're starting to get some random paneling designs, right? Like so. And maybe that's a little bit much. Let's say our max is like 2.5. Something like that. Yeah, so we're starting to get something there. Uh, let's also uh, just do a rand. And let's actually just copy this right here. So we don't have to type all that in anymore. So let's do random function or a random uh, value from this detail iteration value. And that gives me kind of this staggered look, right? And so now we can go and change, you know, our selection values. But at least it gives us a nice way to, to split this up into smaller panels. And you can play around with your uh, weighted grouping values as well. Maybe like 0.1. Eh, 0 0.01 was fine. Maybe just 0 0.2. Yeah. Really depends on the look you're going for. All right. So with that, we now have our panels to work with. So let's move on to the next step. Let's actually put some uh, net boxes around these guys. And I'm going to call this my setup. And this is going to be called our grouping. So do our uh, grouping like so. Very cool. All right. So with that, let's move on to the next step. All right. So now all we need to do is make our panels because we pretty much have all the groups and stuff that we need. So um, I'm going to do a poly extrude here. And this guy is going to then inset a little bit like so. This basically is the paneling thickness or the panel lines thickness, I would say. Very cool. And I want to output the side here uh, so I can go and split that away. So let's split that. And we will split that on our extrude side here. And then I'm just going to invert it because I really just want to give my paneling lines just a little bit of a depth to it. Now we're also going to have to uh, fuse these guys here. So I need to uh, fuse this in order for this to work. There we go. And uh, then all we need to do is go and give this a little bit of an inset, so maybe like 0.005, and then just a tiny bit of depth. And basically this becomes your paneling lines. This works really well for normal maps, stuff like that. You can play around with that even more. Really depends on the look you're going for. You can also round it out as well um, if you want to uh, create more of a rounding effect. I'm going to actually leave it this way. It'll give it a little bit more punch in the normal map. All right. So with that, uh, we can go then and merge together our base panels. So these are our base panels and our paneling lines. So let's turn off our groups and attributes there. Take a look. So now we got our panels. Now I just want to put the bolts on this. All right. And so for that, we're going to have to go and inset from our panels. So let's take care of that. So I'm just going to do a poly extrude here and inset those guys just a little bit. Let's turn back on our wireframe on shaded there by hitting shift W. And then let's just middle mouse click and drag, use the increment ladder here and pick a position here. And I don't need the uh, side for this. Very cool. So now that's basically where all of our bolts are going to go. I'm going to create a group node and get the borders, the border edges. All right. So I'm just going to call this uh, borders and set this to edges. And we are going to basically do it by unshared edges. That basically gets me a group here that I can keep. Right. And what I want to do is I want to get rid of all the other edges. All right. So in order to do that, we're just going to use a dissolve node. All right. And inside of here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say exclamation mark uh, borders. And what's that saying is we want to keep everything but those borders, or we want to actually, it's the reverse of that. We want to delete everything but those borders. And I also want to uncheck our remove inline points. So now you can see we have just a perfect outline for our paneling, right? Very cool. So what, all we need to do now is just uh, extract curves out of this. So let's just use a carve node for that. So I'm just going to do that. And in this carve node, I'm going to set the first U in, to zero and the second U to one. And we're just going to basically cut it all internal U breakpoints. And this will give me 
primitives for all that stuff. Super cool. So now I've got curves, right? So there's no more geometry here. Um, and then from there, uh, we can go and fuse everything because I just want to get these back into single primitives here. So I'm going to basically resample it. So I'm going to fuse all those points together and then use a polypath node to turn those back into just regular curves that we can use to resample. So now if you look at your primnums, you can see you have curves for each one of those panels. Super useful. It's actually very useful for a lot of different things in this whole technique here. It doesn't have to be paneling. All right, so then at this point, let's just resample this. This will give us our points to copy to. And I want to resample a polygon edge. If you don't have that on, you can see you get these um, corners here. Now, you might want that. I don't know. It really comes down to what you're modeling. All right, so now we've got a bunch of points along our curves here. And so I'm going to set this to like 0 0.05 for now. Actually, let's do 0 0.2. Yeah, that looks pretty spaced out. Cool. And that basically gives us our points. Now, we also are going to need our normals. And so we need to track back into to the point where we actually lose our normals, which is at the carve node here. So let's do an attribute transfer here. Let's just do attribute transfer. Where are you? There you are. And let's do that. Sweet. Uh, and so inside of this attribute transfer, we really just need to transfer the end. All right. Just so we just so we know. So with all that information now, uh, let's go and create a sphere. This is going to become our bolt. So let's go and create that. I'm going to set this to polygon. And let's make it kind of smooth here. The final mesh won't have the actual bolt geometry on it. Then let's uh, clip this in the Z direction. All right, so let's go and do that. So Z direction. The reason why I'm doing it in the Z direction is because it's going to whenever we copy to a point, it's going to be facing in the direction of that normal. And so that is the Z direction for whatever we're copying onto the points. Beautiful. So now we've got our bolt. Uh, let's actually use a transform, make it a little bit flatter. Now you don't necessarily have to do this, uh, but I'm just going to scale it down on Z a little bit, make it feel more like a bolt head or maybe a rivet head like so. You can make any shape that you want there. Uh, we can also control the uniform size of this as well, which is going to be very handy for our bolts. And then finally, all we need to do is uh, put down a copy to points node. So let's just select both these no nodes here and feed them in to the first input. And there we go. So now we got bolts all over everything. And let's go and scale this down until we get a nice size. Now, one thing you might want to do is just a really subtle effect here is doing attribute randomize and the randomize the P scale value. So that'll control the scale of all these guys. And for this, I only really need the dimensions of one because it's just a single scale value. And let's just make it really subtle. So 0.75 to one. Yeah, just really subtle just to break it up a little bit more. All right. So now that we've done that, um, let's merge everything together. Yeah. So let's merge our bolts in with our panels over here. Do a little bit of organization. And there we go. So now we have bolts and panels. Pretty cool. And actually relatively easy. So but that's why I really wanted to show this particular technique, because it's actually not that hard. Um, you just need a good way to extract out just the curves. Right. And so now we have control over um, our inset for the bolts here by using this slider. So we can inset these guys to wherever we want them to be. And then you have controls for the size of your um, paneling lines here. Usually we keep these guys pretty, pretty tight there. And then you also have controls for the depth. So let's do um, the lines depth just so we know uh, this is going to be the bolt off offset. And this is going to be the lines uh, thickness like so. Cool. And then let's uh, bundle all this up in a net box here. We'll call this uh, panel construction. There we go. So with that, we're pretty much uh, good to go. So all we need to do now is uh, get our color IDs working. And we just need to bake out some norm maps in our color map and our AO map. So let's do that in the next step. 
Let's now focus on getting our vertex colors all set up for the color ID mask inside of uh, Quixel Mixer. So um, I'm going to start with the bolts, and that one's easy. I just need to add a single color here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it to my primitives, and we're just going to give it a red color. That's what I did for my example. And I think the <laughs> B scale is a little too much. Let's do 0.85. I just want it to be really subtle. Yeah. There we go. All right, so then we need to do the actual panels themselves. And so I'm going to um, create an assemble node here. And this is actually a nice trick to get these color ID maps out quickly. So I assemble it, and that works because these are all separate pieces of geometry. They're not fused together. And so now we get a, a name attribute uh, per piece there. So you can see that we get a per piece. And then all we, can, all we have, need to do is drop down a color node here and set this to a random by uh, attribute. So if I do primitives, uh, random from attribute, and that attribute is this name attribute. So if I just do name, and it can be any attribute, as long as it represents each panel, right? And so now I have a, a random uh, color for that. So now when I merge these guys in here, I get all my color IDs. So this will allow me to put like sections of paint on certain areas of the model. And I have a way to mask out just the bolts using a bright red or a value of red. Cool. So one thing we do need to make sure of is that we um, promote this to a vertex color. So I'm just going to promote this from uh, primitive to point. And the attribute we want to promote is the color attribute. There we go. Cool. So the next step now is to generate the low-res mesh and uh, the UVs for it. So let's do that in the next step. All right, so let's go and get our low res hooked up. So I'm going to utilize an object merge node, and I'm going to grab the two before we cut it up. So I'm just going to call this get low. And with this selected, I'm going to come up to the top here. And one thing we should do is actually just put down a null node here. We'll call this our low mesh, just so we can reference it quickly. So let's go select our object merge node again. And I'm going to drag and drop that null node right into that object one right there and then turn off our transform information because we don't need it. Uh, it's being created inside of this node and so the transform information is already there. So now we have the low mesh, right? It's just the two before we cut it up, which is going to work perfectly in this particular instance. All right, and so uh, in order to create nice seams for this, I need to figure out how to get or select, I should say, one of these uh, edge loops here. And so I want to do it procedurally. I don't want to do it by hand. So I'm going to do a, another group by range here. And all I really need to do, right, set this to points. So let's set that to points there. And I need to get the number of columns uh, because I want to select one point out of every single column here. All right, so to get that number of columns, we go up to the, the tube here. I'm going to get the column value. I'm going to copy that parameter. And I'm going to then paste this into this guy right over here. So we're going to select one of so many columns, right? So one of 49 in this case. So that leaves me with this one point. But you'll notice that for every single row, it selects one. So one of every 49 points there, right? It selects it. Now, one thing we should do, now this will totally work right off the bat. Let's actually um, roll through this process before we split this. I actually want to split it into two just so I have more space on my uh, texture sheet. All right, and so I'm going to call this um, group my seam points, like so. And I need to do a group promote because um, our UV flat node works with uh, edges. All right, and so I want to get a group promote. I want to, I want to promote this point group uh, to an edge group. And the reason why I'm doing that is because here inside of this group by range, uh, there is no uh, edge so group selection there. And so I want to convert from my points to my edges. And the group I want to convert is the seam points. And the new name is going to be called seams. Now you notice that I get all these edges here. So I just want to include only elements on the boundary. And that gets me a perfect seam I can use for the UV flatten node. So now I can drop down that UV flatten node like so. Hook this guy up like that. And then set, set my seams or my seamas. <laughs> Let's actually change that just so we're professional here. All right, so it seems beautiful. Now I'm going to save my scene, go into my UV view. You can see now I have a nicely unwrapped tube. 
procedural UVs for a tube. <laughs> now, like I said before, uh, or I said earlier, I want this to be split into two shells, basically. And so uh, to do that, I'm just going to divide this uh, column count. So let's actually click this label here to get back to the expression. I'm going to divide this by two. And uh, let's go and take a look at here. And you can see that it's actually kind of offset a little bit. Now, that's most likely because we have an odd number for our tube. And that actually is not most likely. That is the reason if I were to put this to 50. Yeah, so now you can see. So just have to keep that number even, uh, in this case at least. Not a big deal. All right, so now we get perfect seams there. And if I were to take a look at my UV flatten, I have two shells. So now we just need to do a UV uh, layout node. Beautiful. Look at that. These are perfect. All right, so I'll probably uh, drop. I just want to take up more space in there. Now, this is the only downside to this particular technique. This is totally not procedural, what I'm going to do right here. I'm just going to scale this on X so it fills up the entire sheet there. Um, and that'll totally make it really rough to actually put decals on it. So in this particular case, your decals will have to be meshes that sit on top of the, the uh, low res mesh. But in this demonstration, it'll work just fine. All right, so let's um, put a net box around this. And I'm going to call this my low mesh. And uh, this is my high res mesh. So I'll just put a null node here just to give myself some information. There we go. Very cool. And then the last thing we need is our bake node. So let's do a labs mass baker. I do have the latest version of the SideFX Labs toolkit, so you'll need that in order to use this particular node. Now, if you don't want to bake here inside of uh, Houdini, you can always do it in Substance Painter or whichever baker you are most comfortable with or like the best. All right, so with that all done, we are now ready to bake. So I'm going to bake this to a 2K map here, and I am just going to send it to wherever the HIP file is saved into a render folder. I'm going to leave this at default like so. Uh, let's take a look at our trace distance. I'm going to set this to something smaller, so 0.05. I don't need to cast the rays that far. And then I want to make sure I, I generate my normal map, my vertex color map, and my AO map. That's really all I'm going to need for Quixel Mixer. So with that, I'm going to hit save uh, to save the scene, and then we are going to render this out. And when that is done, I'll be back, and we'll take a look at the results. All right, so let's take a look at this. Looks like we need to put some normals on uh, all this stuff. So let's uh, put our normals on here. Totally forgot that step. So normals, I'm just gonna make sure that this is totally smooth. And for our high res mesh, we'll do the same. Actually, I'm gonna put it above my null node there. Yeah, so now we have proper normals for everything. And I'm gonna have to go and bake this out one more time. Uh, because we got weird normals there, just because there weren't any normals present. All right, so I'm just going to bake this one more time. All right, and there we go. Much better. So make sure to put those normals on there. All right, so that looks pretty good. We have a nice AO map, and we have a nice normal map. So with that all done, let's uh, jump over into Quixel Mixer and take a look at uh, texturing this. All right, so let's uh, jump over into Quixel Mixer and get this guy textured up. It won't take that long. Um, and the, to do that, we actually need to get the FBX file out of here. So I'm going to drag and drop a ROP FBX output node here. And I'm going to delete this export OBJ and just wire in uh, the low res mesh into the FBX node here. And I'm going to call this my um, whole panels 002 because I already have one created so I just want to make sure I can find this particular one so with all that that's pretty good pretty much good to go let's do a save to disk and let's jump into Quixel Mixer here so I've gone ahead and created a new mix inside of a new project and I'm going to go to my setup tab here and go to custom mesh for the model settings and that particular asset is right here so uh, it's probably going to be in a different location on your machine so I'm just going to load up the FBX file so that way I can uh, see my glorious uh, tube here. <laughs> uh, let's go and uh, load up our normal map. So let's go get our normal map here. 
I'm going to go into where I saved those guys. So now I have my normal map. That's looking pretty good. Uh, let's load up our occlusion map. There we go. I'm just going to increase the intensity on that. It's looking pretty nice so far. Yeah, and then finally we need our material ID. So I'm just going to turn this guy on by loading up the material ID texture as well. Cool, and you can see it's already automatically gone and isolated out all those colors for you. So if you, you know, want to, you know, specify your own colors, you're going to have to do that inside of Houdini. But that's why I use this assemble, that assemble node technique. So let's go back to Houdini here really quick and take a look at that. That's why I do this. So it's really just an assemble node and then a color node with a random from attribute. Just a really quick way to generate a bunch of different uh, color IDs. All right, so the first thing I did here in my local library, I just went to metals and I plopped on uh, this iron first. I kind of blended two metals together. So right off the bat, that gives you a really cool look. Um, the one thing I do need to do is go to my placement and turn down my scale to something like 0.1. Uh, and you can also scale up your models inside of Houdini by just putting a transform node. That actually looks pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I went and um, put on an Illumin on, on top of this and just to blend them together. Again, I need to plot the scale down to like 0.1 because I like the, the different scratches there. So let's do 0 0.05. Yeah. It's pretty good. And then you can go and, you know, mess around with all these values here to get the look that you really want. Made it really shiny. It's pretty cool right there. All right. And so one thing I noticed, you know, about the Starship, SpaceX uh, Starship, is that the aluminum, and you see this quite often, is kind of wavy, right? It makes it look kind of fragile, but um, it is pretty strong. So what I did is I um, went and turned on my smart materials, and they actually have an aluminum foil yeah, so I put this aluminum foil as my base there. And uh, right off the bat, it's going to be way too strong. Um, and so one thing I don't want is any of that uh, displacement. I don't care about any of the displacement for this particular model. All right. And most of the effect is coming from this folds right here. And so I'm going to pump up the radius so it blends nicely. And then for the scale, I'm just going to find a good location for this. I really want to make this kind of large and uh, I also want to kind of pull back the the normals so I'm going to go to the normals here just pull this, the normals down a little bit that just gives it that kind of cool look for these different panels yeah very nice all right so uh, the next uh, thing that I did is I went and created a solid layer over here and is did I just put that in there yeah Let's move this up and out of that group. So I created a solid layer. And this really is acting kind of like a dirt. All right. And all the defaults are pretty good here. I'm just going to go and make this like a dark brownish color. Like so. I'm going to go and add a mask stack to this. And the thing I want is curvature. All right. And the levels. I'm just going to tighten these guys up here a little bit. So you can see it's already starting to work pretty well. Something like that. Yeah. And then I usually take a noise through that. Right. So I add another noise to this, like a simplex noise. Change the frequency. Uh, the amplitude can be changed too. It really depends. I'm actually going to leave it. Uh, I do need octaves though. And we can up the kind of noisiness of it. And then just uh, multiply this over. And it just kind of breaks it up. Yeah. Allows me to break that up like so. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, one thing I need to do is let's turn off our metalness. There we go. Yeah, it just really kind of highlights those paneling lines. Ah, you could do whatever, you know, there's a lot of different things you could do here. All right, so then I went and created another solid layer, and basically this acts as like the paint. And so I'm just going to pick like a, a dark, I think I did like a black color here. And I'm just going to use the um, add ID mask and just start picking random colors from here until I get something that I like. Yeah, maybe not that one. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it just kind of lets you explore 
you know, different looks. Got a really tiny guy right there. Yeah. And that pretty much was that. All right, you know, you can go and mask all that stuff out if you want some, like, noises and stuff. Actually, what we can do is just copy this mask stack uh, and let's paste it onto our paint. That's going to get rid of it. So all we need to do is just uh, invert it. Yeah, it's not picking up the curvature stuff. Very cool. All right, and that is how we create procedural panels inside of uh, Houdini. You can always go back and change um, any of these values up here. All right, so if you were to change, you know, something like the, the rows, you get different paneling looks, paneling designs, really depending on the, the mesh that you want. And then you can also go and, um, you know, add another uh, channel here to change all of your weight and your seed values. So you have control over that. And then just uh, re-export. Easy peasy. Obviously, you know, this is working well for a tube. If you have something like a boat hull or like an airplane, um, I'm sure you're going to have to you know, find a couple other tricks, but that is the, the core idea right there. That's the core concept behind um, extracting out these paneling lines and uh, creating uh, cool textures for them. All right. Thanks so much.